button. Okay, uh, and I'll hand the floor over to uh, the group one from MEC2, which is Pondero. Perfect. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation. Thank you for joining us today. We are group one, and today we are presenting Pondero, a small-scale heliostat for use in concentrating solar power. I'm Kristen, and today I'll be presenting with Lisa, Hunter, Alex, Kyle, Brett, and Darren. So first, I'm just going to give you a little overview of our presentation today. First, we will be starting with the motivations that led to our design. Next, we will be going over the customer needs that we were given to meet with our design. Next, we will go through the subsystems um, that we broke our design into, um, what needs were associated with them, and then the calculations that show how we met each of them. Next, we will go into an overview of our cost and break it into the different sections that led to our cost, um, followed by a talk of the innovations that make our design such a unique one on the market. We will end with a question answer session, so feel free to write down any questions that you have along with the slide number so that we can answer them at the end. The first, the motivations for the Pondero Heliostat. Um, we first started with the hedgehog concept, which we came about with three different questions. The first question is, what are we passionate about? For our group, we decided that we are passionate about being eco-friendly. We wanted to make a design that would make concentrating solar power and renewable energy accessible. Um, and we also have some key features that, about our design that make it especially um, environmentally friendly. Next, the next question we wanted to answer was, what can we be the best at? For us, I found myself in a group of extremely creative engineers. So I knew that we could be the best at making a design that with features that haven't really been seen before on the market. Next, we wanted to answer the question, what drives our economic engine? For us, this was pleasing the customer. We wanted to meet as many of the customer needs as we could and have unique features that would satisfy the customer even more. Now, just a quick overview of our Heliostat. Our Heliostat works by first having the electronic subsystem read in a signal from the central tower. Once it receives the signal, it will communicate with the actuation system, which consists of motors and spools. The spools will either roll in or release the wire to move the reflector subsystem about both the elevation and the azimuth axes. The reflector subsystem is supported by the reflector support subsystem, which is connected to the module support. This is mounted to a concrete slab. Now, just quickly going over our customer needs map, we started with a total of 19 needs given to us by the customer. Then we went about trying to figure out how to quantify these needs into quantitative metrics. And then we split them up into our five different subsystems based on which one we thought was associated with each. And then over on the far right, we have how each of these needs was met. And we'll go into this in more detail with each of our subsystems. For our reflector subsystem, there are six specific customer needs that were targeted. All were fulfilled by quantitative metrics that the reflector subsystem meets. Our reflector subsystem consists of four reflectors. Each of, these, each of these reflectors are circular in shape and have an area of 0.246 meters squared, the total area of 0.985 meters squared, which satisfies customer need two. A distinct attribute of this heliostat, heliostat is the shape of the reflector. While many use rectangular shapes, we decided to go with a circular shape. This was supported by background research, which indicated that a circular shape is ideal for reflecting light. In addition, a circular shape reduces the wind load that acts on the reflector support. Originally, the design included a plexiglass surface and a silver coating to reflect sunlight. This reflector was strong, reflective, and smooth, which satisfied, satisfied many of the customer needs that we had. However, when we tried to find a supplier for this material, we found that it was heavy and costly, and both of these attributes limited us in terms of meeting the customer needs. We started thinking about other industries that might have solutions that we could use for our design. Two fields emerged, window tinting and horticulture. Buildings with, which buildings with large windows found that an abnormal amount of energy was used to cool rooms. Some suspected it was due to a large amount of solar energy coming in through the windows. To combat this problem, mirror film was created that would re reflect much of the solar energy that hit a window. This film was light, thin, and cheaper than plexiglass and silver. The other field was horticulture. Some gardeners had noticed that putting plants on or near reflective surfaces would be beneficial for the plant, and metalized mylar sheets started to be used. We explored these metalized mylar sheets as well to see if this was an option that we could use to fulfill our need. After doing research and comparing available mylar film and window sheeting, we made the decision to switch our design from plexiglass and silver to mylar film. This mylar sheeting was similar than, was cheaper than mylar mirror film and had a 
a higher, um, a higher reflectance. The reflectance of the mylar sheeting came to 92 to 97 percent, and it could withstand temperatures of up to 374 degrees Fahrenheit. These attributes fit what we needed, and the film only cost 45 cents per reflector. Mylar is cheaper, lighter, and is easily attached and replaced. This mylar film would probably not last the full 20 years of the heliostat, but the maintenance cost to replace the film if it gets worn or torn or damaged is low. This mylar film is easily washed as well, having a low surface roughness and not being affected by water or soap, which meets customer needs well. To determine the backing of the reflector, we wanted something that was cost-effective and light. Using an ASPI plop, we found that wood has a very good cost-to-density ratio. We found a popular plywood to use for the backing. This plywood is also sanded, so it will provide a flat surface for the mylar to be glued to. To protect against moisture and other erosion, a flex seal coating will be applied. A concern that we wanted to explore was thermal expansion under the conditions in Las Vegas. The temperature differential in Las Vegas in 2021 was 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Using that temperature differential, as well as the thermal expansion of poplar plywood in both the length and thickness dimensions, we found that the max thermal expansion that the plywood experienced in length is 0.03%. The max expansion in the thickness is 0.13%. These expansions are small and are not predicted to affect the functionality of the plywood. To calculate thermal input power, we used this equation. To calculate Q, we needed the angle between the normal vector of the heliostat and the position vector to the receiver, as shown in this figure. A challenging aspect of this calculation is that the position vector of the heliostat to the receiver is different for every single heliostat. In addition, the vector of the sun to the heliostat changes every second of every day. We decided to use the, the, the position of the sun on September 21st, 2021 at 12 p.m. to use for our calculations. This is the exact middle between the solar and winter solstice, so it should be an average position of the sun. To estimate how many heliostats we would need, we calculated H for four heliostats around the receiver 50 meters away in the north, south, east, and west direction. We calculated theta for each of these heliostats by finding the receiver position vector of each one and using the dot product relation between that and the position vector of the sun. We use that theta to calculate Q of each one. We then calculated that we would need at least 4,000 modules to reach the one megawatt customer need. Using, using this estimation, we modeled the heliostat field. We did this by using a MATLAB code to arrange a field of heliostats in a rectangular array with rectangles that encompass the previous one. Using the MATLAB code, we calculated the thermal input power of each heliostat based on its position in the field and summed them to get the total thermal input power. We ended with 45 rows and a total of 4,500 heliostats. The average thermal input power per module of this field was 234 watts. To reach the one megawatt goal, we will need 4,270 modules, which our field meets. The concentration ratio of this field would be calculated by the total area of the heliostats over the area of the receiver, which we estimated to be one meter squared. This gives a concentration ratio of 4,433 suns, exceeding customer need 18. Another concern with the reflector was the deflection due to wind. Using a SOLIDWORKS finite element analysis, the maximum deflection of the reflector under average wind conditions was found to be 0.00021 meters. This would only occur if the, if the reflector is exactly perpendicular to the ground, which shouldn't occur under normal operating circumstances. This deflection bends the reflector less than 0.05 degrees off its original position. If we estimate that this would have a 1% effect on the efficiency of the reflector, that will result in an average thermal input power of 211 watts. The heliostat buffer is meant to aid this deficiency, although this, defici this deficiency will not largely impact the overall thermal input power, as this won't occur under normal circumstances, and even if it does, it will only impact a small percentage of heliostats at one time. We believe this calculation meets the customer need of minimizing dispersion, as the deflection of the, of the reflector will have minimal effect on the overall thermal input power. This is our reflector support, which attaches the reflector to the main module. We used off-the-shelf parts, which are used to not only keep the overall price low, but also the assembly time. We were able to, okay. we were able to calculate a factor of safety of greater than two, and the material properties of aluminum are able to operate under the conditions in Las Vegas. Looking at factors of strength, density, and price, we used Ashby plots to determine that an aluminum alloy would be the best option for a reflector support system. The unique use of a ball joint allow for two rotational degrees of freedom and make it possible to remove the reflectors for efficient cleaning, which we will explain further why this makes the design more eco-friendly. A spring is used in the design of the reflector support. The max load and spring rate ensure that the spring is sufficient in its use of returning the reflector to its initial position as opposed to just relying on gravity. A buckling analysis was performed using material properties of aluminum the Yale strength and elastic modulus. 
Since the slenderness ratio was found to be greater than the demarcation value, calculations for an Euler column were performed to find the critical load of 3,714 newtons with a factor of safety of 592. So we can conclude the reflector support will not fail under buckling. Here is the factor of safety formula for the max shear stress with sigma yield over sigma bending. Solving for the velocity and with a factor of safety of two, we find that we can withstand the maximum wind speed of 36 miles per hour under normal operating conditions, which meets the standard conditions. This is our modular support subsystem. Our modular support was designed with the, with the following four customer needs in mind. One, three, six, and 10 respectfully. Our design is 1.2 by 0.955 by 0.55 meters in length. The size and geometry of the sport were revised in an attempt to lower costs. Our original design used two triangular trusses to support the frame. It was, it was also roughly twice as tall. By re removing one truss and reducing the height, the cost was lowered. The support can hold four heliostats per model, two on the lower level and two on the upper level of the support. This design has a relatively quick assembly time due to its simple geometry. To assemble the support, it's as easy as screwing and fasteners. If you can build a Lego, you can build our modular support. Simplistic assembly also leads to simplistic replacement. If a beam component is damaged, the user simply unscrews a couple of fasteners, replaces the beam, and then refastens. Wood was chosen as the material of choice due to the cost and durability. We originally picked aluminum as a material. However, our first design had an extremely high cost. Research into other alternatives showed us that by using wood, we had cut our modular support cost in half. We decided to seal the wood and flex seal to increase its resistance to environmental conditions. We decided to use cedar wood beams because of its many applications in the real world. Cedar has a high durability and was heavily used in boat making. This made us confident that our support could withstand environmental conditions. Cedar chips are used as an insect repellent because of the chemicals within the wood. This will help keep pests away from our more sensitive components such as our electronic subsystem. We need to fix our support to the ground, so we decided to fasten the support into a concrete slab. The following equation was used to calculate the area ratio between the reflective and modular areas. Our design has an area ratio of 0.86. The shading of the heliostats is avoided with the, with the two tier modular support design and the layout of our reflector array. As mentioned previously by Hunter, our array is composed of 45 rectangular layers. In total, our array takes up an 180 by 158 meter field. An optimal spacing of layers was found to reduce shading and total area of the field. That distance was found to be 0.8 meters. Using the optimal spacing, our array will ensure that there'll be no shading of the heliostats from when the sun is 30 degrees above the horizontal in the morning to when it reaches 30 degrees above the horizontal in the evening. This yields about five hours of unshaded sunlight per day. In total, our array utilizes 4,500 model modules. The following needs correspond to our actuation system, need 5, 7, 8, 14, and 15. These needs will be covered in the following slides. So first of all, we have two types of actuation that are very similar. We have our single spool actuation and double spool. Single spool is what is shown here. So to begin, we have a NEMA S17 stepper motor with an output torque of 0 0.33 Newton meters, and it operates at 1.58 amps at 12 volts. It also has an incremental step of 1.8 degrees per step. For the gearbox, it's a two-stage machine. The first stage is a 10 to 1 worm reduction, and the second stage is a input rotational output translational spool, which allows us to reel in the wire or release the wire as needed. An interesting feature of this gearbox is that it's non-back drivable, which allows us to position our heliostat and then cut all voltage to the motor um, while keeping it in the same position. This will allow us to save our customer money over the long run. We also have a very small incremental step of 0 0.03 degrees um, of cha a change of reflector orientation per step and an output force of 25.4 pounds going to the wire. For our second spool or double spool system, um, we'll begin with just discussing the spool covers and motor covers briefly. Um, these covers are uh, here to keep the environment uh, sand and pests out of our um, important 
components such as the spool and the motors. Note that this uh, motor cover also has vents to help in heat dissipation. As far as the gearbox goes, it's the exact same thing, except now that our output force is half since there's two spools sitting on the same shaft. And then our double spool was our unique solution to eliminating motors. So originally we had eight motors, two per reflector to achieve our um, independent axes. However, this was a very detrimental to our budget because we were paying for two extra motors, you know, two extra gearboxes and all the parts that come with it. So our solution was to create a double spool gearbox in which the right spool is right hand wound and the left spool is left hand wound. That way, even though the spool is rotating, even, even though each spool is rotating in the same direction, the wires on either side are being released and pulled oppositely. For the wire, we chose a Daiwa Spectra fiber fishing line. It has eight braided lines for increased durability, 55 pounds of maximum tension, and we plan to replace it every three years. The benefits of this uh, fishing line is that it has Spectra fiber by Honeywell. Spectra fiber is hydrophobic, abrasion resistant, has high UV resistance, and able to wound, is able to be wound around small diameters. This is a key differentiation between steel and fishing line as we have a very small spool radius. We were also able to save 40% on our bulk cost savings compared to its steel counterpart. So you might be asking how the actuation system works as it seems a little complicated at first glance. So if you see the figure on the left, the blue dots represent where the actuation will be connected to the reflector. So, um, the wire from the spool to the reflector, and the green dot below is where the spring will be mounted. These are mounted at a um, distance of 0 0.198 meters at 45 degrees north of east and north of west. In the center figure, say that we have two wires being released along the directions shown in the same velocity, we will be able to achieve rotation about our elevation axis. However, if two wires are being um, released and pulled in the direction shown on figure three, we will get rotation about our azimuth axis. So to dive into our rotation per step calculation, we begin with the 1.8 degrees per step that the NEMA provides. After the first stage is complete, this turns into 0 0.18 degrees per step on the shaft that the spool sits on. To calculate the change in wire length um, for the spool, we use the equation of R, the radius of the spool times the change in the angle of the shaft it sits on. Plugging the numbers in gives us 0 0.062 millimeters per step. And then using the equation below, we solve for a reflector uh, angle change of 0 0.025 degrees per step. Briefly reviewing our back driving feature or non back driving feature, I should say. It is known that if the coefficient of friction is greater than the tangent of the lead angle of the worm, then the system is self-locking. For a coefficient of friction for nylon-nylon contact, it can be seen that with a corresponding lead angle of 9.47 degrees that our system is in fact self-locking. Lastly, we'll be going over the force delivered to the wire. Um, this uses the mechanical advantage of the worm the efficiency of the spool and the radius of the spool with the values shown below. And it yields a 25.44 pound force of tension. This will be halved for the double spool gearbox to 12.7. Our electronic subsystem meets four needs in total with those needs being need one, eight, nine, and 16. Need one is met by using small electronic components that are able to fit within a small electronic box with four mounting points. This box is small enough to fit into the design without requiring other subsystems like the module support to be made larger, and it can be mounted quickly due to only having those four mounting points. Need eight is met by picking low cost electronics that meet our demands, but do not overly exceed them. The system achieves automated sun tracking using the electronic scene here. The Raspberry Pi Pico is the brains of the system using predetermined code and weather and sun data from the central tower via Wi-Fi. The Raspberry Pi, Pico, Raspberry Pi Pico does not have Wi-Fi support natively though. So the Adafruit Featherwing Wi-Fi coprocessor is wired into it to allow it to have that capability. 
The starting position of the heliostats are found using limit switches that are attached to the, the reflector support. From there, the Raspberry Pi Pico uses the stepper motor drivers to control the motors. Those stepper motor drivers are operating under 12 volts of power from the power grid, and they operate at 1.58 amps, which is the current our motors are rated for. To help reduce the heat, the stepper motor drivers we've chosen have heat sinks built into them. And we've added venting to the sides and the front of the electronics box. We've calculated the internal temperature of the electronics box using a maximum recorded temperature in Las Vegas of 47 degrees Celsius and under the assumptions that the electronics box is an opaque and a diffuse surface. We've also assumed the electronics are operating under 90% efficiency with 10% heat loss. We've used a solar flux value of 1,367 watts per meter squared, which correlates to the atmosphere where that value would be lower at surface. Using these assumptions, we've calculated an internal temperature of 66.21 degrees Celsius, which is well within the operating range of our electronics. Now that we have gone through each of our subsystems, I'm going to go over our cleaning and maintenance procedure for the Ponderos. So one of the unique features about the Heliostat is that the reflectors are very easily detachable. This allows us to use a unique cleaning method for them. This method is the dishwasher cleaning method. In this method, we would remove the Heliostats and place them in a large scale dishwasher. This would allow us to recycle and reuse the water in future cleaning instances. This makes our heliostat especially eco-friendly and it also makes it cost-effective because we are able to reuse the water. Another feature of the detachableness of our heliostat is that it does make it easily replaceable as well. As you can see in the figure, there are only four connection points per each reflector. These points are two strings, the ball and socket joint, and then a spring as well. Um, all of these points are easily disconnected so that we can replace the heliostats as needed. Next, I'm going to go over our safety configuration for the heliostat in instances of high wind or hail. Um, first, we have our wind configuration. In this configuration, we would have our reflectors parallel to the ground. This would reduce the amount of area upon which the wind can blow on. Um, using our calculation, we can get a max wind speed of 152 miles per hour with a factor of safety of two. This allows us to um, be able to be safe with the max wind speed that was recorded in Las Vegas. This wind configuration would be our priority configuration. Um, this is because if we put it in the hail configuration in the instance of both wind and hail, it could damage other components as well. Um, whereas if we put it in the wind configuration during an instance of both, it will only damage the reflectors which are easily replaced as mentioned before. And then for our hail configuration, as you could see, we would have the reflectors perpendicular to the ground. This would minimize the amount of area upon which the hail could fall upon. So now just going over some key features of our heliostat that make it such a good product. As I previously mentioned, the reflectors are detachable, um, which allows for easy maintenance and cleaning. As Darren mentioned, we do have a self-locking actuation system, which makes us even more environmentally friendly in the fact that we are not using excess energy to keep our reflectors in place once we have positioned them. Additionally, we do have an extremely high degree of accuracy for the positioning of our reflectors of 0.03 degrees. Um, this ensures that we're not having excess opti optical losses due to being an, unable to accurately position our reflector. Next, we do have a high reflective area to surface area ratio of 0.86. This means that we're maximizing the area that we're using for the field and being really efficient with it. Um, next, we do have easy access to the actuation system for maintenance. As mentioned, the gearbox can be easily disassembled for access to those inner parts if they need to be replaced. So the final topic that we will be covering today is the cost of each individual module. In designing Pondero, we found the cost to be the hardest customer need to meet. With a provided budget of $100, we are currently around four and a half magnitudes greater than desired. The most expensive feature on our Helios that is the actuation system, which we originally thought would be quite inexpensive in the early stages of our design process. After analyzing the system, we realized items such as worm gears would need to be utilized and the cost quickly became north of $200. The module support and reflector are also moderately expensive at this time due to high wood prices as Alex stated before. 
the reflector support and electronic subsystems with the least expensive design um, parts in this design. The cost was split up into two main categories, cost of materials used and cost of manufacturing. The cost of materials was approximately $390, with a large majority of it being from items purchased directly off the shelf. The worm gears, bearings, and screws alone added $120 to the actuation system, while the motors and electronics are also driving this price up. Custom parts are accounted for by the pieces of the helios that they need to be injection molded which is a fairly small expense. The raw material are the items purchased in large sizes and need altering in order to fit our current design. The cost of manufacturing is measured by the amount of labor it requires to fully assemble our design. The manufacturing labor consists of the labor price for producing injection molds, which is 50 cents per piece, as well as the cost to cut raw materials to their desired dimensions. The assemblance cost was determined by using the Boothroyd and Dewhurst charts and the salary for carpenters and electricians in Las Vegas, Nevada. Assembling the frame and gearbox were the longest processes to complete, while minor assembly procedures, including mounting and electronic connections, were also accounted for, making the assembly cost hover around $34. The last item implemented to find the total cost was the energy consumption of the Raspberry Pi Pico and the stepper motors, which is 21 cents. The final price is $466.09, although we are still looking into ways that certain costs be mitigated. At this time, the degrees per step can be higher for the selected motor, so a cheaper and less accurate one, such as a DC motor, can be selected as one way to lower the price. So why us? Although our price is high, we feel that our design is able to meet the rest of the customer needs with several unique ideas. We have optimal rotation angles and high reflectivity. Our module consists of little to no shading from one mirror to another. In measuring the cost, we use reliable vendors and know the materials that we are getting are of high quality. We are also environmentally friendly as we recycle water and feel that our design is the greenest on the market. We want to thank our sponsors, Arigo, Carrier, Cummins, and Northrop Grumman for taking the time to listen to our design, as well as the UF faculty members in the Renewable Energy Conversion Lab. At this time, we'll be answering any questions that you guys may have, and we thank you guys again. Hey guys, this is Tom Singer from Northrop Grumman. Uh, could you give a little more detail on the actuation system? Because I, I saw six actuators for four mirrors, um, and I, I was trying to understand, you, you had said that you're pulling on the, uh, on the wire um, either in the same direction to rotate above uh, about elevation or opposite directions to rotate above uh, about azimuth. And I'm not sure that I understand how you're achieving that with six motors and two strings tied to each mirror. No problem. So, yeah, I was just trying to run through for the um, essence of time. Kristen, could you go to uh, like with the whole system? Yeah, let me find one. No problem. Okay, so let's just look at the top row of heliostats here. I know it's kind of busy with the wires and I apologize for that, but basically the gist is, is you have your single reflector and you're gonna have an outer wire and then an inner wire. So the inner wires are gonna be connected to the central gearbox. So the central gearbox is essentially Ving off like this with two wires. And why we did that was we didn't want any wire crossing for abrasion to just wear down and then we would have to replace them much sooner. So if you just start with the top heliostat closest to the page, um, the first wire is gonna be attached on the outside, which is the outside motor at the corner. And then as you move into the double spool gearbox, that wire is gonna be attached to the inside of that reflector. And then do you have any questions as far as the rotation goes or was it just strictly how they connect? Well, I guess what, what I'm not clear on is, so, so you retract the, uh, the wire on the motor closest to the page, right? And right. on the center gearbox, if, if we want to move that mirror that's closest to the page about elevation, you would want to pull 
that wire in as well, right? So you're you're like running both the motors, uh, say clockwise as we're looking at them, um, and then as you're doing that, the opposite spool that's connected to the uh, the other mirror is running is winding the other direction, right? So it is releasing wire on the mirror connected to the back, right? Or am I correct. am I misunderstanding what's going no, on? No, that's correct. Okay, so how do you achieve elevation on both of those mirrors simultaneously? So for the elevation, yeah, this is a mess up on our part. We were we were really worried about the azimuth and that's why we we were focused on that. But yeah, that's clearly okay. a flaw. Yeah, no, it's it's just yeah, I'm I'm not sure yeah. it's gonna work. Um it, okay, so so that side, um let's see, you were you were mentioning uh back when you were doing the uh the structural analysis. So I think on slide eleven Here you go. Right. So you're showing deflection of the uh, of the plate uh, under wind. Um, I hate to see a fem for something like this. I mean, this this is something you know. If if you're looking at deflection, you could get straight out of uh, Rourke for you know a circular plate with uh, uh, with loading like this. But uh, given that, um, is this really where the deflection is going to come in your system if you're concerned about aiming your uh, your beam? So are you talking about like, um, well, I, I don't quite understand your question. Um, when you say like, where, where the deflection is going to come from? I mean, you're, you're saying, well, we're, you know, our, our reflector is rotating less than, uh, you know, 0 0.05 degrees from its original position. So our beam is going to stay where we're aiming it, right? That's that's the the point of, of doing this analysis here. <laughs> Are you talking about like the, the beam that the, the reflector is attached to? No, no, no. The the beam of light that you're reflecting back to the collector. Oh, yes, I believe so. Okay, so your your structure is much. The deflection of your structure is going to be much more than just the deflection of this mirror surface, right? So you've one more got time, so. you know. You've got fishing line and, and and springs, right? And I, I would expect that to be significantly more compliant. So if there's wind loading, that wind is just going to sort of push your whole thing, uh, your whole reflector off offline. So I, I would expect that you'd find that to be a much bigger effect on on your ability to aim uh, your reflectors. Gotcha. I understand what you're saying. Like that, the the deflection of Due to like the the wire and stuff, the fishing line and the spring, that would that would deflect more than the, like the 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 disc, basically. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so I, I, I would expect that to to be a significant effect. Um, you you'd mentioned for for cleaning. I, I like that you're thinking outside the box on on cleaning, and I like that you're thinking outside the box on the actuation too. Um, but for cleaning, you know, the the goal of hey, we're in the desert and we want to not use a lot of water, so you know, we're gonna take these off of where they're located, bring them to some centralized location where we, you know, have a source of water and we can recycle that water. That's, that's an interesting concept. Um, I wonder how feasible that is to do with an array of, I think you said like 4,500 modules, each with four mirrors. So we're talking 16,000 mirrors that you have to, uh, you know, to clean, you've got to pull them off the stands, take them somewhere, wash them, bring them back. So how frequently would you have to do that? And what sort of operating constraints does that provide? Definitely. So I think, I think that part of the idea was that we obviously wouldn't take all of the heliostats at once. That's why we do have the buffer. Yeah, yeah this would be like, you know, many. painting a bridge where you, you know, you start painting the bridge and by the time you're done painting, you got to go back to the beginning and, and start painting again, right? So it'd be sort of a continuous process, but um, like how, often are you going to have to cycle through 16,000 reflectors? Um, I'm not completely aware of how like dirty the reflectors will get, like how quickly that will happen. Um, but the idea is to do it as needed. And then additional um, benefit of it is that 
they can then be checked for damages as well and be replaced, like completely switched out with a new reflector as well. Um, and that like allows to for, for us to ensure that um, the field is being like as effective as possible because that allows us to check for damages as well. Mm -hmm. And and while we're looking at this picture, uh, why are these reflectors circular as opposed to square? Yeah, so we have a slide on that as well. Um, that actually came originally from our background research. We had found a study of the aerodynamics of heliostats as well as the shading, um, which stated that um, circular reflectors are the best for that to reduce like to be able to withstand high wind loads as well as to have a smaller heliostat field as well. Um, and then how this process worked was we each came up with our own concepts for the reflector um, and then went through a decision matrice, matrix of each of the concepts. And our calculations that we did for like wind load and shading did find to support the background research that we had. So that is why we went with a circular shape. Okay, that, that seems inefficient from a manufacturing perspective, right? And if the hedgehog concept is, is eco-friendly to have a significant amount of waste and, and maybe I don't know I guess if you if you sort of like you know stagger the circles from a, a larger sheet but it, it seems like it's going to create a lot of manufacturing waste not to mention increased cost of cutting a circle versus cutting a straight line that's a good point so I'll, I'll stop monop. I'm, I know I tend to monopolize these, but uh, I'll, I'll sit back and, and let a couple other people chime in here. Um, I have a question. This is Elise from Cummins. Um, yeah, I really liked um, how you tried to reduce the a number of motors uh, to um, simplify the design. Um, I had a question about the deflection. Did you look at the uh, deflection of the plywood uh, under its own weight? I think that was could actually it warp over time. Or? That was an, an analysis that I had done when we were trying to figure out um, how to reduce the like the amount of wood that we were using on the module support. Um, so we did do an FE analysis on that as well, and we did find that it was able to support its own weight. Um, additionally, um, as the heliostats are being removed or the reflectors are being removed for maintenance, if it is noticed that there is some bending in the module support, um, it is really easy to um, attach a new piece of plywood as well. Okay, thanks, yeah. Um, at what point would it be not accurate enough? Like how much deflection is allowed? I guess you said 0 0.05 degrees, but um, like for, for under its own weight, how, how much can it be bent and how would someone uh, figure that out and be able to measure that in the fields and know when to replace it. Are you talking about the um like the um, reflector or for, for like the module support uh support uh version? the reflector <clears throat> yeah that's a good question um we didn't like we don't have a specific angle where it's like hey if it's past this we need to replace it <clears throat> excuse me um <clears throat> that would be something that we would just have to like you know we would probably figure out would it like, be like a measurement um like a distance like from you measure at one point and another point and if it's off by a certain amount like at the middle and at the end at the radius um, then you can measure that somehow yeah yeah i don't know if you have like a distance or uh, accuracy in your um customer okay. uh, requirements yeah there was no there's no customer need for that um and there was there wasn't like a a metric that we defined that said we you know it, it can't deflect more than this. Um, that 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 that, that, that think would be something we would um, we could find to like use to figure out like if we need to replace reflectors or not. Okay. Um, any more? Questions from our panelists? I'm curious I have a few on the... questions. Oh, sure, go ahead. Sorry about that, mine will be quick. Uh, the first is, do you have any numbers on the maximum and minimum acid and elevation angles for your system? I'm curious because springs typically have a minimum maximum operation range. 
Yep. So our springs have uh, our springs will facilitate a 90 degree rotation for the elevation. Um, I believe they're four inches at a, um, you know, non tense position and uh, 11 at the fully tensioned. So it's uh, yeah, that, that that was accounted for and it, it will facilitate our rotation. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, and my next question is just on the on the base. So it looks like in order for you to get some really accurate, consistent positioning, you're relying on having really, really flat terrain ground. Um, correct. Sorry? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we, we, um, we assume that, you know, I, it's going to be relatively flat. Um, so our, our degree of accuracy is very small or like our incremental steps. So we should be able to fine tune around any, you know, minor um, slopes on the ground. However, if it's drastic or if, you know, the terrain is pretty bumpy and stuff like that, then this would be a problem. We'd probably have to get, um, you know, clear the area as much as we can, flatten it as much as we can, which would of course be more cost to the customer. Cause it's almost like a pre-prep before installation. So how often do you foresee needing to recalibrate the system? Brett, do you want to take this one with the electronics? Yeah, so um, we were predicting that like just at the start of every day, we would use the limit switch and then like maybe like one time throughout the day, reset it to that position just to like get the starting position again and then go based off of that. But the limits, the limit switch typically helps for you know, if your base is entirely flat always, how to make sure that, you know, exactly where your motor is starting from. But if your base you know, gets even the slightest bit of an angle, calibration will be off. So you'll have to... A potential solution, here. sorry to chime in, a potential solution we could do is just eliminate the concrete slab and you know, put the wooden pole post into the ground and try and even it off that way if the terrain's that bad. Um, and then from there, we would need like a, a base to mount on so we could you know, get some plywood and uh, fasten that there. That way we're able to mount the other um, actuation systems or so. Okay, actually part of my inquiry comes from the fact that I didn't realize it was a concrete slab. So thanks for clarifying that, appreciate it. No problem. All right, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll maybe come back to the uh, to the wind loading. So if if these are are located in an array of you know four thousand or, or whatever these modules, uh, and the wind's blowing, say from from left to right, as as we're looking at this picture, um, my expectation is that that wind is not going to be a nice uniformly distributed pressure on each of these mirrors, right? You're going to have uh, some turbulent effects as the wind is, is kind of passing, you know, from the one upwind of it, uh, you're going to have some, some shading. So, so I would expect that probably the tops of these mirrors are going to have uh, the more significant wind loading on them. Um, and given that your, uh, your wire system or, or fishing line system uh, is is not going to take tension very well. Um, I, I feel like that wind loading is, is just going to kind of rotate uh, your mirrors uh, about the uh, the hinge point, right? I, so so I think again, you know, kind of going back to you know the the deflection in the system is is going to be much more than than just the deflection of the in individual plywood panel uh, relative to itself. It's it's going to be uh, a, a much more system-wide effect that, that'll be significant here, I think. Um, in the in the configuration that, that you said you're you know you're going to lay them flat for high winds, uh, again that's that's a situation where you know wind passing over a flat plate uh, at I, I think you said you were good for 150 miles an hour. You're going to they're going to flap right. They're, they're not going to be nice and stable because they're you know not even close to rigid, I don't think, in, in that configuration. Um, so those, those oscillatory effects uh, would, would concern me. Um, the fishing line itself, uh, how are you planning on 
tensioning the line. Sorry, it was muted. So, right, so, so, go ahead. Yeah, when when you've got sort of the the counter winding spools, like how how were you planning on tensioning the line on those spools? So the tensioning on the wire would primarily be done on first installation. Um, one of the is there benefits, some adjustability in the connection to achieve that? Um, not at the moment. Not at the moment. Um, I yeah, it would be. Yeah, yeah, we should definitely. Okay. Um, yep. Okay, uh, and you mentioned that that the line would be replaced every three years. What's driving that life? So um, normally, fishing line is not very UV resistant. So when it's out in the sun, it deteriorates. It's not supposed to be out in the sun. Um, so you know, th this, this fishing line isn't pure spectra fiber. There's still, um, you know, normal, normal um, polymers that are involved in fishing line in it. So this was just, um, it was a conservative thing, just so, um, you know, and also another factor of like the UV fatigue is that the wire starts to stretch. So then when it starts to stretch, like it's not going to be, um, we're not going to keep the accuracy that we had before. So it's mostly to do with like stretching due to um, the UV effects based on the system, but it is much better than, and, you know, normal fishing line. And do you have some way to characterize that to come up with a three-year replacement cycle? Um, well, we haven't done fatigue calculations on it at the moment. I imagine that would be extraordinarily hard to calculate. Yes, um, it would just because we're, it's, it doesn't really seem like a cycle, you know, if everything is perfect, obviously it's not, but, you know, ideally it would be in constant tension. Um, but, you know, like you mentioned before, the vibr the oscillatory effects are going to start, you know, causing cycles through the line and it'll probably be hard to um, quantify like the forces with that oscillation. So it would be very dis difficult. Yeah. So, so what, so when you say replace a line every three years, is that just uh, an engineering estimate as we would call it in the business? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. There you go. And then on your, your venting configuration, you, you'd mentioned that uh, you were putting, putting the electronics and the, and the drive motors in boxes to uh, keep out pests and sand. And then those motors are, or those boxes are vented. Um, are those vents potential ingress for tests and sand? Do you want to go to the CAD model slide on the electronics? So the plan is to mount this vertically. And then we've done these Louvre vents where they're angled down um, the electronic box is meant to keep sand out and also like water. So with the, like the angle on them facing down like that, um, we I do think that it would help limit that stuff from getting in because the only openings at the bottom there and most of the stuff we're worried about getting in would probably be coming at it from the side or above. So I don't think that would be too much of an issue. And uh, as far as uh, the motor covers go, um, the the ground set would be mounted very close to the concrete slab. So I'm not uh, anticipating, you know, a lot of sand and stuff like that. And the gaps are very small. Um, the whole motor uh, or the whole gearbox uh, assembly is very, very compact. So it's not really, it's not big enough to be like a home for pests or anything like that. Um, as far as the sand goes with the top mounts, it may be, um, it may be an issue for the actuation mounted on the top of the assembly frame. However, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to add louves just in case it almost acted like a funnel for the sand. If the wind is blowing in the right direction and it, all the sand is just getting collected. Um, so I, I figured it would be better to just leave it open and hope that, you know, the sand isn't getting you know, the vorticity isn't so high on the wind that the sand is just getting whisked up there. And additionally on those vents, if like sand did end up becoming an issue getting into those vents, those vents on the inside of them, we could like get the type of dust filters that are commonly used on PC components and just mount those on the inside. And then that would help a lot with sand if it were an issue. 
how much margin did you have on your uh, your thermal analysis? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not sure I quite understand what you mean by that. I mean, you. What was your? I mean, if if you start obstructing flow with uh, with those filters. Oh um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, we would yeah. we would have room. We would have room to do that. I think we could handle that restricted restricted flow, because like our Raspberry Pi Pico can operate up to eighty five degrees Celsius, and right now we're looking at sixty six point two one. So we would have to do the calculations if we were to do that. Um, but I I think that it would be fine. Additionally, okay. um, I'm, I'm this just... analysis. So sorry. I was just gonna say additionally, this analysis here was very conservative. We used a radiation from the atmosphere instead of the one at the surface um, and stuff like that to make sure we had a conservative estimate here. So it would definitely have some room for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at this and, and it seems like you were relying on, on just heat transfer through the box itself, is that right? Um, yes, sir. And then a little bit of heat generation from the electronics. Yeah, so if you can deal with, with that, why vent the box at all uh, we had decided to vent the box prior to doing calculations because we were anticipating heat being an issue so we preemptively addressed the issue and then we this was just a design when we had done the calculations to determine that okay well if, if you do the calculations and they show you don't need the vents and then, then i would suggest taking the vents out they're going to eliminate the uh the contamination problem and make it easier to manufacture yes sir yes sir okay so um i'm looking at the time and we're actually a few minutes over so we should probably wrap it up there, uh, especially because we're all going to need to migrate to the next presentation in a moment. Um, so I want to thank these guys. You guys were the um, the guinea pigs in a way. You're the very first group to go on the very first day uh, for oral presentations. Uh, so it, it takes some um, you know, some guts to intentionally sign up for that spot, knowing that you guys are the first ones to go. So I appreciate you guys kind of, uh, you know, taking one for the team and, and <laughs> agreeing to do that. So uh, have a great presentation um, and appreciate the, the back and forth discourse and the questions and the answers. I think you guys get, did a really good job with that. Uh, so with that, uh, I think, oh, and Dr. Dong has in chat, great job. Um, so we'll hit the record stop button. <laughs>